Okay, so <clears throat> the point of last time was kind of crucial for our course. So remember, we have defined the Hessian of a function, and we, have we studied as a particular example the Hessian of the height function, so surface point and the plane, okay? Okay, so remember we are, you have to make computations for critical points if you want to determine properties of the action of a function. So in that case, critical points correspond to points where you are studying the height of a function based on a plane which has a normal vector A, for example. And critical points we knew by geometric interpretations where exactly those points for which the normal vector at the surface at that point corresponds exactly to the normal vector to the plane that you are looking at, okay? Thanks to this, we studied the Hessian, and we identified the Hessian with the height function with respect to the, to the plane with the second fundamental form, okay? Very well. And then all the interpretation, Gauss curvature and so on, the surface lies on one side of the tangent plane, crosses the tangent plane, and so on. So that was the moral of, of last lecture. Today we, we play a similar game, but with a different function. Okay, so we take a, our regular surface S. We take a point outside or inside, as usual. At the moment, doesn't really matter. Anywhere in R3. And we look at the function F to be the distance square. Okay, so F, actually let me write it here, F from S to R to be defined to be the function which at, at a given point gives you the norm squared of the vector P minus P naught. Okay, so this is the distance squared. Now we know already what it means for a point to be a critical point for this function. So we gave the geometric interpretation also in this case. So remember, P is critical for F if and only if, how, let's say it precisely, if and only if P naught lies in the normal line, so it's uh, in the normal line at the point P, okay? for some lambda. Okay? So in particular what I drew is not a critical point because the normal line here would go somewhere else. So here if I want to guess where is a critical point I should go more or less there. Okay? So how much is the action of this function at a point like this? Well, Remember, so compute d squared, the action at a, at, the, at a point like this of the function f. So what do we have to do? This is the second derivative of f composed alpha. Okay? So instead of writing f composed alpha, I already take the explicit expression of the function and I substitute to the point p alpha of t. So So now let's do it even without writing, because this is what? This is alpha, alpha of t minus p naught scalar alpha t minus, t no, minus p naught. First derivative, of course, is what? It's it's twice, twice alpha prime scalar alpha of t minus t p naught. Remember, don't compute it at t equal to zero because you want to do the second derivative, okay? Okay, so this is d in dt at t equal to zero of the first derivative at t at the generic t, okay? So this is the scalar product alpha of t minus p naught, scalar product alpha of t minus p naught. So if I take the derivative of this, I get alpha prime scalar alpha t minus p naught plus alpha t minus p naught scalar alpha prime. So twice alpha prime of t, alpha of t 
minus p naught. So now we have to take the second derivative and evaluate at t equal to 0. So this becomes, um, <coughs> if I take, so it's twice times what? So the derivative of the first becomes alpha double prime of 0. So this twice goes outside times this evaluated at 0. But alpha of 0 is p by definition of alpha, so scalar p minus p naught plus alpha prime at 0. Oh, actually, here I should have added, so the Asian evaluated at a vector v, okay? Plus alpha prime at 0, which is v, scalar alpha prime at 0, which is again v, so plus the norm square of v, okay? This one, no, because when I take, so the question is, sorry, I have always to repeat, the question is, this, is this V or V minus P naught? Well, no, because I'm taking the derivative, okay? So P naught disappears because it's a constant vector, okay? Now, the point is, what is P minus P naught? Now, let's use the fact that it's a critical point, because this is true everywhere, eh, for, at any point, okay? But now, we have a relationship between P and P naught if we allow lambda to come into the game, and uh, it's okay for us. So P minus P naught is equal to lambda. In fact, P minus P naught is equal to minus lambda N. Okay, so this becomes twice times the norm squared of V minus alpha double prime at zero lambda N. In fact, lambda, I could put lambda outside and here I have n of p. Okay. But we know this. We have a geometric, uh, I mean, a, an interpretation of a factor like this. As usual, it's uh, Euler's theorem, if you want. So the acceleration at that point of a curve scalar product, the normal, is exactly the second fundamental form. Okay. So this is equal, this is equal to twice the norm squared of V minus lambda, the second fundamental form at P at the vector V. Okay, remember, here I use Euler's theorem for the geometric interpretation of uh, the second fundamental form. Okay. Okay, so what can we deduce out of this computation? For example, corollary one if S is compact. then there exists P in S such that P is elliptic. Well, uh, such that K of P, for a moment, K of P is greater or equal to zero. Okay. How is it possible? I mean, let's prove this and then I will write a second corollary. Why is that? Well, uh, the Gauss curvature is the determinant of the second fundamental form. So basically, you can translate that statement in say, by saying that there exists a point where the second fundamental form is semi-positive, definite. Okay? Now, Now, do I have critical points on a surface for this function? I don't know. Unless I put a, to I put a topological condition. Okay? <laughs> That's why I put compact. Because if, co if it is compact, any continuous function has at least a minimum and a maximum. Okay? So there exists 
P1 minimum for uh, F and P2 maximum for F. Okay? So at least I have two points where I can play this game. Otherwise, I cannot use this formula. Here I used, in the last step, I used the fact that I had a critical point. Okay. So at least I have these two special points. Now, which one will be good? If I have a minimum, how much is the Hessian? Well, the Hessian would be positive definite, okay? Is it good for us or it's bad for us? I mean, if this object is a positive definite, in fact, strictly positive, but I mean, quadratic form, is this okay? Well, it depends on lambda, no? Because here, out of this, of course, I take this factor. The two is irrelevant. I take this factor here, this, this addendum here, I put it there, and I get that lambda, the second fundamental form, is less than the scalar product. So as quadratic forms, I'm comparing the second fundamental form with the scalar product. Okay? That's the way I want to prove that there exists a point where this is positive definite. So if I want to use this trick, I need to put this one on this side and then say that the second fundamental form is bigger than something which is positive definite. The scalar product is clearly positive definite, okay? This is the idea. So where I can use this trick? How do I use this trick? Well, it's better to take the maximum, okay? If I take the maximum, but then you will realize that it's irrelevant. If I take the maximum, I have that it's negative definite deviation, okay? So I can put the second fundamental form on the right. So I get something that looks nice, norm squared of a, of a vector less than lambda second fundamental form. So this implies what I want if I can argue that lambda is positive. Okay, so out of this I get the norm squared of V is less than lambda, so at, at the maximum point, huh? sorry, at the minimum point. Uh, the norm squared of V is less than lambda second fundamental form. So now, why should lambda be positive? After all, in the, con in the geometric interpretation of a critical point, I'm saying something is a critical point if and only if P0 lies on the normal line. But who is telling me if it's above or below? Lambda means exactly this, no? the sign of lambda. But now think for a second. I can make lambda to be whatever I want, positive or negative. I mean, the value I'm not free to choose, but the sign I'm free to choose. Because if lambda is positive, I'm done. If lambda is negative, I reverse n. You see here, lambda positive, so n, the term is the sign of lambda. For one given choice of n, maybe I'm getting lambda. So if, if I choose n to be this one, then lambda positive means really it stays above. OK? And in that case, I'm, I'm happy. But if for some reason p naught was here, I reverse n, and lambda becomes positive again. And the Gauss curvature does not change sign. OK? That's, that was an old observation we did. The principal curvature changes sign, changed sign. Okay? The mean curvature changed sign, but the Gauss curvature doesn't. Okay? So now you understand that actually both were good. Because at the minimum point, by at, most, at worst uh, switching the orientation, I can assume lambda is positive, and this inequality proves that the second fundamental form is positive definite. Okay? And I'm done. But at the maximum point, this was negative. I put it the other way, the other side, 
And I, see, I seem to get the wrong inequality, but I can make lambda to be the one I want. And I make it again the good inequality. OK? So that's it. So at those two points, I get k greater or equal to 0. OK? OK, let's, uh, let's freeze this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this story here. And now, or in any case, ju but just remember that this topological assumption was there only to guarantee the existence of a minimum of a maximum. If for some other reason you know that your surface has, and there is a point where, for which your surface has a minimum and a maximum, those points will be of, of, of non-positive, of non-negative curvature, okay? Very well. So now let me start with uh, uh, one of the biggest theorems we are going to prove in, uh, in this course, which has a very weird statement. I mean, it's something that certainly doesn't look like a great theorem at the beginning. It seems a very technical statement. No, 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 I, let's skip it. Otherwise, I cannot prove this theorem, which is long and big, OK? Corollary 2 will be an exercise, <laughs> OK? I mean, you can see, you see how flexible this argument I gave you is. You can draw many conclusions out of this, OK? I just wanted to show you the, the line of the argument and then. So let me state and prove. Hilbert's theorem. As I said, it's certainly it's a statement which doesn't warm your heart at the beginning. You will have to wait half an hour or 45 minutes to realize it's really an important statement. Now, so you start with an oriented regular surface. And of course, you call, I mean, we keep on calling k1, k2, the principal curvatures. Okay. Oriented means it's orientable, and I fix the choice of the normal vector n. Okay. So oriented means it's a surface plus the choice of a normal vector. If I have done a choice of a normal vector, I have a choice, I mean, I know what k1 and k2 are, okay? Otherwise, there is this sign problem, okay? But you fix n, and at that point, there is no ambiguity what are the principal curvature. Then suppose there exists p, a special point on a surface, on the surface, such that 1, K, the Gauss curvature at this point is positive. So suppose there exists a point of positive curvature. Two, suppose that K1 has a local minimum, so the small principal curvature has a local minimum at P. Three, K2, so the big principal curvature, has a local maximum at P. Okay. So under these three assumptions, P is umbilical. As I said, this doesn't look like a fantastic theorem, OK? We should be able to judge what is a great theorem by looking at the statement. And this seems a very strange way to find umbilical. But remember, umbilical means that the, the two principal curvatures at P are the same, OK? Who cares? You will see, 
Okay. Now, freeze the problem y, and let's try to prove it. <clears throat> now, we have our surface somewhere in space. And of course, all the things that we are doing in the geometry of surfaces is invariant by rigid motions of R3. I mean, if I take a surface and I translate it in space, of course, principal curvatures, mean curvature, Gauss curve, everything will be the same at the corresponding points. If I take a surface in space and I rotate it, okay, principal curvature, mean curvature, Gauss curvature will be the same. Okay? Everything, so our geometry is kind of or uh, O3 plus translation invariant in R3, okay? So just for convenience, we can assume that our special point, you know, we start with the surface with a special point, actually is actually the origin of R3. We can suppose P is the origin. <coughs> And this would be just a translation in space. And then, thanks, with the rotation, I can also assume that the normal vector at this point is, for example, the standard vector along the z-axis. Okay? So it's 0, 0, 1. And this would be kind of a rotation only of one axis. I really want to make full use of the rotations of R3, I can do something, something more. Um, I, can, I can say that the, the, the principal directions at this point, so this is something which lie in the tangent space, okay, with a, with a rotation of R2 keeping this normal line fixed, I can put them in the position I want. This is an orthonormal basis of a two plane. Okay, so with the rotation of this plane, I can put it, for example, in the standard position. So I can assume E1, the standard vector 1, 1, 0, 0, and E2, 1, 0, 1, 0, are actually the principal, curve, principal directions Now, unfortunately, I really need the whole blackboard. So basically, what it means, we have put our surface in the position where the, the, the original point has become the origin. The tangent plane at that point to the surface is the xy plane. The normal vector then, of course, it's forced to be this one or minus this one. I suppose it's this one going up, OK? And the two standard vectors of R2 are the principal directions. Okay, this is achieved with translations and rotations of R3. So nothing has changed in the, geom in the, in the curvatures and everything. Okay? Very well. <clears throat> now, we have our surface somewhere here. Okay, so now this is more or less the picture. But now, either as a corollary of the implicit function theorem, or if you want, you can use this and the previous discussion we made about the height function. We know that locally, there is at least a neighborhood of this point here, of the, of the, of the point P, which is the origin, where the surface is a graph over the tangent plane. Of course, the tangent plane in this case is the standard R2. Okay? So around P, S is locally the graph of a differentiable function F. Okay? So that means that there exists a function defined around the, around the origin of R2 with values in R, such that S 
becomes the graph u, v, or if you want, x, y, f of x, y. Okay? So now let, let me try to understand what, which are the properties of this f. Well, let me translate everything we said here in terms of f. Okay? So all these properties translate into what? f of 0, 0 is 0, okay? Because I want the origin to go to p, okay? So p is 0, 0, 0, so f must be 0 at this point. <clears throat> then what else? We can also assume that the partial derivative, what are, what are the, 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 um, the a standard basis of the tangent vector? So if, if you want, you can construct now a local parameterization around this point of the form graph. Okay? So the standard basis with respect to this parameterization of the graph, of, of the tangent plane to the graph, is the vector x u, x v. Okay, so it's 1, 0, f u, and 0, 1, f v. I can certainly play the game in such a way that f u at the point 0, 0 is 0. Because the ta and now I'm, try I'm writing the fact that the tangent plane is the horizontal plane. Okay? At that point, only at only at the origin, the tangent space is the horizontal plane. So that means that the components of x u and x v in the vertical directions are zero. Okay? So f u at zero, zero is zero. And f v of zero, zero is zero. Okay? So now I, what I've written, I've written this property and all together, the fact that the tangent space is the horizontal, and then, of course, the normal is this one. They come together, okay? Very well. So, basically, that means something more geometric also. It means that the direction u, so, and of course, since this is true, what is x u at 0, 0? Well, writing in this, term, in this language, it becomes E1. Okay, so x u is automatically not just any tangent vector, but it's the, principal di the first principal direction. And x v is the second. Okay, this comes for granted. Now let me write all these assumptions in terms of f. Okay? Now I have three hypotheses. So that means compute first and second, of course, how do I express k and k1 and k2? The only way I can do it, if I have a local chart, I express it, I, I have to compute all the coefficients of the first and the second fundamental form. Okay? But this is a graph, so it's very easy. Okay, in fact, okay, let's do it. But I mean, if, mm, well, no, otherwise there is no time, okay? It's, it's actually simpler than the examples we did. So E, little e, if you make the computation becomes F U U, Divided, probably actually we did something like this, plus f u squared plus f u p squared. Okay? f little f, oh sorry, little f now seems uh, fighting with the previous notation. There is no confusion, okay? One thing is the function, one thing is the coefficient of the second fundamental form. So little f becomes f u v divided by the square root over the same thing. I mean, this object that I'm writing below is always EG minus F square capital. Okay? And that's what happens above. And little g is FVV 
divided by square root plus f u squared plus f v squared. And these are, these are true on the whole neighborhood, so not just at the point 0, 0. Okay? These are general formula for the coefficients of the second fundamental form of a graph everywhere, everywhere covered by the graph chart. Okay? Now, what do I know about these functions? Well, the other thing I know, since u is essentially corresponding to the first principal direction and v is corresponding to the second principal direction, the other thing I know is that f u u at the point 0, 0, nowhere else, I mean, I have only an assumption in 0. So at the point 0, 0, this is nothing but k1 of p. OK? f of u v at 0, 0, you see, the point I'm saying is that the, co the, the coordinates u v really correspond to the principal directions. But that means that the second fundamental form is in diagonal form at that point, OK? And of course, the first entry becomes the first eigenvalue. The, the, the one outside the diagonal becomes 0. And the, the other on the second entry, second, second, second line, second column, is just k2. OK? So this is again coming from having required that these are the principal directions. OK? OK, now let me define two curves, which are kind of instrumental. They don't carry any particular meaning, except they are useful for doing the computation. So define two special curves on the surface, like this. Alpha, and I call it the parameter u, to be just the image of the first coordinate function. So x of u0. Basically, if you imagine this to be the graph, actually what I drew is globally a graph, but I mean, for what we know in general, this, this picture is true only locally. So basically, if this is the coordinate u and this is the coordinate v, I'm taking this line, no? because I'm taking v equal to 0, this line here, and I'm looking at its image on the surface. This is alpha. OK? And then, of course, I do the other one. I take u equal to 0 and v free. Uh, so that means I take this line, and I go and see which is the image on the surface. And I call it beta. Okay. And then I define another other two curves e, that I call capital E1. So in fact, these are in some sense are vector fields. I mean, E1 as a function of v, so this is kind of defined only on, on, on for, for a parameter v, to be 1 over the norm of x u at 0 v. <clears throat> times x u, so it's the, the unit vector in this direction, OK? And symmetric, so you see, now I'm playing kind of a dual game because I'm, I'm taking it as a parameter v, but I take derivatives with respect to u and I put u equal to 0. So now I do the opposite game, e2 of u. And then, of course, this will be 1 over xv, the norm of xv at u0, yeah, at u0 times xv at u0. Okay. These are just definitions, okay? You will see why they are useful, but I cannot really convince you. But which are the properties of all these things? So, for example, E1, at every point, E1 is what? Is, the tan is a tangent vector to the surface at the point of the form b b beta of v. Okay? Okay? 
And dually, this object here is a vector, but it's not any vector. It's a tangent vector to a point alpha of u. Okay. That's just because the tangent space at every point is spanned by x u and x v. No, so the only point is that since you are computing at this point, this is exactly the point beta of v. No, and this is this is a tangent vector, but it's computed at u zero, which is the image of I mean alpha of u. Okay, so. And they are just normalized. They are of norm one. So, OK. Unfortunately, I have to erase the hypothesis, but because the computation is still. Yes? I didn't understand that K1 has a local minimum, K2 has a local maximum. Maybe they should be changed? No. So the question is you find it quite uncomfortable yes. set that the small one has a minimum. And the big one as a maximum. It seems more intuitive to ask kind of the opposite. Now, if you want the two, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a right observation. I mean, you have two functions. One is above the other. And somehow the conclusion is that at that point, they are the same. So basically, you, you, seem to, you would like to push the small one up and the big one down. No? And he is asking exactly the opposite in some sense. If you push the small one down and the big one up, they are the same. Okay? So I think you got why it's an interesting theorem. Because it has an, a non intuitive hypothesis. Okay? Now, Okay, let's keep that one, and let's go on here. Having defined all these things, we can define two special functions. Let me call it so. I keep on defining objects. I call it h1 of v to be what? To be the second fundamental form at the point beta. So since I have a special tangent vector, special, I don't know why exactly. You will see in a minute. I have a special tangent vector at the point beta of v, let's compute its second fundamental form. OK, so of the vector e1, e1 twice, OK? And let's define h2 to be kind of the, again, the usual. As a function of u, the second fundamental form at the point alpha of u of e2. Okay, and here I write it only once because I don't have space, so you, you count it twice, okay, as usual in our notation. But we have an expression for the coefficients of the second fundamental form, which is good for all points in this neighbor, not just at the origin. So we know how to compute those functions. For example, h1 of v, in terms of the coefficients, because you see, e1 is a multiple of xu, OK? So the second fundamental form evaluated at xu, xu, by definition, is little e, OK? So how much is the function h1? Well, it's exactly f, that expression, f of u, u, f of u, u divided by the square root of 1 plus f u squared plus f v squared. Now I have just to be careful that e1 was not exactly x u, but it was normalized. Of course, this is a quadratic form. So if you multiply a vector by something, the something goes out. But it is multiplied twice. So it goes out to the square. OK, so it's divided by the norm squared of this, function, of this vector x u. OK? But this is a, another thing I can express easily, because x u, well, we wrote it only at 0, 0. But of course, in general, would be the vector 1, 0, f u. OK? So the norm, the norm squared of this vector is 1 plus f u squared. 
Okay? All this evaluated at the point, not at every point, but only at the point zero V by definition. And same way, H2 of U, now this is the second vector in my ordered basis of the tangent space. So this becomes the second coefficient okay, of, the, of the second fundamental form. So, and for the same reason, this is FVV divided by the square root of 1 plus FU squared plus FV squared times, now I have to divide by the norm of, F, of XV squared, okay? XV is 0, 1, FV, so it's norm squared is 1 plus FV squared, okay? And this is computed only at the point U0. Okay, why we have done all this mess? It's clearly complicated objects, but now, now you see why it was convenient. How much is H2 at the point zero? Well, by definition, it's just the second fundamental form at alpha of zero. Alpha of zero is P. Because if you put U equal to zero, you are getting X of zero, zero. So that's P. So this is the second fundamental form, is equal to the second fundamental form. At P of what? What is the vector E2 of zero? Well, E2 of zero, it's small E2, okay? Twice, and with our notation, I don't duplicate, okay? But what is the second fundamental form? How much is the second fundamental form at P of in the direction E2. Well, but E2 was the principal direction in the, in the corresponding to the eigenvalue K2. So this is actually K2 of P. But K2 as a maximum. So now let's start using a hypothesis. Everything we said up to now was completely general, no? Now, K2 has a maximum at P. It's the big one, and still we are asking it as a maximum, contrary to. So that means that this is greater than or equal to K2 at any point alpha of u for u sufficiently small. Okay. But this is also greater than or equal, so now this, to the second fundamental form at the point alpha of u of, to the vector E2 of u. Because this is the maximum of the eigenvalues. So if I compute the second fundamental form at the same point, twice on any vector, I have to, take, I have to get less or equal. They are equal if and only if this vector stays the principal direction. I never said that. I know it only for u equal to 0. For u different from 0, I don't know if this is the principal direction. So I'm not saying that this is equal. But certainly, k2 will be bigger, OK? Because it's the maximum of the, of the values of the second fundamental form. On vectors of norm 1, remember, this I'm, I'm using the, the standard interpretation of the eigenvalues of the quadratic form as the maximum or minimum no? on the circle of vectors of norm 1. That's why I have divided by the norm. Because that's the only thing I can claim, not xu. Okay? So here things are coming all together. Okay? And you realize that there was no way to simplify this object. They look bad, but I mean, that's the best you can do. Okay? OK, but what is second uh, fundamental form at alpha of u or at u is, by definition, h2 of u. Now, this is really equal because this is the definition. So what have we observed? We have observed that h not, h2 of 0 is greater than or equal to h2 of u for any u. So in particular, 0 is a maximum 
local maximum for the function h2. So zero is a local maximum for h2. <coughs> Let's see if also h1 has some strange property like this, which actually justifies all the definition. How much is h1 of 0? Well, h1 of 0, where it is? Here it is. h1 of 0 is the second fundamental form, again, at beta of 0. But beta of 0 is, again, p. Okay? Is the second fundamental form at p of the vector e1 of 0. But e1 of 0, let's where we e1 is here. It's xu at 0, 0. But xu at 0, 0 is e1. So we start in the same way, except we change E1 and E2. But how much is this? Again, this is K1. And what are we asking on K1? It has a minimum. So this is less than or equal to K1 at, the, at any point of the form beta of V. K1 is the, is the minimum of the quadratic form. So this is less than or equal to the second fundamental form at the point beta of V of E1 of V. Again, by the same interpretation of the eigenvalues. But this is by definition H1 of V. So what have we learned? So 0 is also a local minimum. For h1. Okay. So the summary of all this is that we found these two functions and we have the property. I can, I can express this property by second derivatives. So in particular, I know that so uh, h2, the second derivative of h2, even though now primes will be with respect to different parameters because h2 is a function of u and the other is a function of v, but it's always one parameter. So h2 is 0. This is less than or equal to 0 because it's a local maximum. And h1 double prime is greater than or equal to 0. OK. Very well. Now there is still a painful step. Because now I really want to see if this, this inequality is really interesting or not. Up to now, it seems like a game that we are playing. Let's compute h2 prime, h prime of u, for example. So we have also, so you see, here, we, have, we, we didn't use the explicit expression for f. I want to write down these inequalities in terms of f. OK? Unfortunately, what it means is that I have to take the second derivative of this with respect to u, and express it in terms of all this mess. Be patient, OK? If I want, at the end, I would like to make the second derivative. Let's start with the first. h2 prime, and then, but I don't have to evaluate it as 0, because I, I'm going to make the second derivative. Well, how much is this? Well, let me group everything in this way. Okay, because, of course, I use the product, uh, the product rule here. So this becomes minus 1 plus fv squared to the power minus 2 times twice fv. Because if I start taking the derivative, so that means in my notes, I started taking the derivative first of this. So I take the derivative of this times everything else. So the derivative of this with respect to u is what? Is this subject to the minus is minus this subject to the minus two times twice f v f v u. Okay, so this is the derivative of one over this, but then I have to multiply by everything else. So, and but let me write instead of denominators now. I prefer powers. So f u squared plus f v squared to the power minus 1 half, OK, times fvv, which is still there, OK? 
FEB. So that's the derivative of this times this. Now, let me take the derivative of this times everything else. Okay? So then I still have a minus. It's better to, they are long formulas. So um, in my convention, changing minus, minus is not a plus. Eh? So minus means minus. Sometimes. <laughs> okay? So that means I'm not touching these two factors, and I take the derivative of this with respect to u. Well, okay, that means, uh, so that's uh, something to the minus 1 half, okay? So that becomes, it becomes minus 1 half, that object, 1 plus fu squared plus fv squared to the power minus 3 halves times Well, the, uh, okay, let's freeze it. We, we still have to make the derivative with respect to what's inside, but this is 1 plus fv squared to the power minus 1. fvv I'm not touching, and I still have to take the derivative of what's inside the square root with respect to u. Okay? And what is the derivative of what's inside u with respect to u? It's twice twice fu, fu u, plus twice fv, fuv, okay? So it's twice fu, fu u, plus twice fv, fuv. And this is the second thing, so we have taken the derivative of this, derivative of this, and then I kept the easiest last, so I can relax. Derivative of this times everything else. So plus now, plus. Uh, but let me write everything in powers again. Fu squared plus Fv squared to the power minus 1 half. 1 plus Fv squared to the power minus 1. And then just the derivative of Fvv. So it's Fvvu. And that's it. OK? at the point u0. Now, you, can, you see how beautiful this is. Now we have to take the second derivative. So this is the moment where you, you change subject. You decide you want to study biology, or you decide that there must be a trick, OK? Well, so instead of doing it with your brains, oh, you can do it, of course. But I mean, we, unfortunately, I just erased. But I mean, I needed space, and I erased a bit too early. We have a lot of vanishing at the point zero. So now this is the, the formula at the point u. But then at the end, we are going to put u equal to zero. And at u equal to zero, we have, in fact, maybe it's better to, to write them somewhere. What do we know? Remember, we knew f u u, let me write it here. f u u zero zero is equal to zero. f u v zero zero is equal to zero. f v v of 0, 0 is equal to 0. And about the first derivatives, but again, f u at 0, 0 is equal to 0, f v at 0, 0 is equal to 0, and f at 0, 0 is equal to 0. So once you remember that we know all this. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. k1 and k2, OK? k1 at p and k2 at p, OK? But you see, once you remember this, you don't change subject yet, OK? <laughs> OK? Because, of course, imagine the procedure to compute the derivative of this. OK? But without even writing, let's start. Is there anything, how can anything survive after the derivative when I put u equal to 0? Because you see, if I, so this, let's take the derivative of the first line. OK? Well, of course, I should do. Derivative of this times this. Well, 
F, but there is an FUV, a beautiful FUV, which at zero will be zero. So I don't do it. So derivative of this, if I take, same thing, if I take the derivative of this times everything else, there is still this beautiful FUV, okay? Uh, very well. So in principle, you might say, well, so, but of course, the derivative of this, there is written nowhere. I, I have no information about third derivatives. So in principle, there could be only third derivative of this times everything else. And actually, this seems to stay, no, because there is an FV. Okay? So you see that even without doing any computation, and then for, for this and this, there is still either one of them. So I'm fine. The first line is zero. Derivative of the first line would be zero, and I don't have to do it. Okay, so let me group here. This is H2, double prime at zero. Okay, and let's see what survives. Because actually very, very few things will survive. But hopefully something will survive. Okay, let's see. Let's play the same game on the second line. Well, on the second line, F here, this, because you see at zero, this is one. So it's not very useful. This is one, it's, it's not useful again. This is K2, which I don't know if it's zero or not. I have no information. So could not, could be you. And how much is this? Well, this is zero for two reasons, okay? Both the first and the second derivative. Sorry, because there are the first derivatives, okay? That means that if I keep on taking derivatives of this, 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 I'm wasting time. The only thing which is interesting to do is the derivative of this times everything else. And not just that, if I take the derivative, when I take the derivative of this, the only thing which is clever to do is to take directly the derivative of this and this, but not of the second derivatives, okay? And when I evaluate at u equal to zero, what does it happen? Well, this, so this becomes, Minus one half. Let's see what, what survives. This evaluated at zero, so one. This evaluated at zero, so one. This becomes FVV at zero, so K2 of P. And now there is a two here. Okay. And now I know that I have to take the derivative of this with respect to u. So this becomes fuu times fuu. Okay? So in this language, well, actually, it would have been better to skip it. Sorry, before substituting k1 and k2, leave them as derivatives of f. So actually, that one was fvv, okay? So fvv is 0 times. Derivative of this, so fuu times fuu, both at zero, okay, plus plus nothing, because this is an fuv, okay? So even if I take the derivative of this, this will kill me, and vice versa. Okay, so that's the only thing which is surviving in the second line. Okay? Now let's go to the third line. Seems amazing that I'm not doing mistakes, but... Okay, second, the third line. Same principle. Well, now it looks a bit more complicated, because you see, I have no information about this. This is one, and this is one in the origin. So what do I do? Well, now I have to imagine that I play. So in, in principle, I should do everything. But without even writing, what, how much would be the derivative of this? Well, this would be minus 1 half this object to the minus 3 halves, which is evaluated at 0, which is 1. So in principle, it's there. So it's actually it's minus 1 half. Okay. Times what? times the derivative of fu squared. And this squared is fantastic because this becomes 2 fu 
F U U. So there is an F U. So it's zero. And when I do it here, it's of course two F V F U V. So there is F V. So it's zero. So now I play the same game, but I have to do one step more. So the derivative of this will be zero anyway. Okay? So I don't do it. Let's see what happens here. Well, again, this will be minus one, this object to the minus two, twice FV, FUV. So there is FV. So the key point is, of course, that these are quadratic. Okay? So when you take the derivative, there is always a linear thing in front. The linear part is zero. So, okay? so also the derivative of this doesn't matter. Throw it away. So we are left with this. Okay, and this, of course, should be there because this is one, this is one, and this is so plus with the sign plus. So here, no bracket, minus this object plus one one f v v u u at zero. Okay, so it was not that terrible. Now we play, remember, remember the logic of the proof. We got this inequality here, and we, are t we, are we want to express it in terms of f. So we are halfway through, because now we know what is this with respect to f. Four derivatives in f, but it's something. Okay? Now we should do exactly the same thing for this, clearly. I'm old enough not to do it, but you are young enough to do it. I prefer not to comment on symmetry properties of these functions. Okay, <laughs> so I can tell you this becomes minus f v v f v v f u u at zero plus the same thing, because actually they would arise as f u u, f v v, but then of course, Schwarz lemma, the order of the partial derivatives is irrelevant. So it's f v v u u at z. Okay? So it's true. I mean, what you were suggesting, it's true. Okay? It's symmetric in everything. What do I get out of this? Well, hmm, in which order do I want to... F U U F V V F V V. So I look at H two, H two, double prime at zero minus H one because of course the nice thing is that there is a part in common. So I take a difference, but it's better to take this one. What do I know about this? First, I know that this is negative, well, non-positive, okay. But on the other hand, I can express it now as what? It becomes this minus this. So there is an f u u f v v in front, no? evaluated at zero times uh, with the plus. I have to take this. So f v v at zero minus f u u at zero. Okay. And now you still don't know why, but you are very happy. Because now you substitute the geometric interpretation of these objects, as we were doing at the beginning. I suggested to do it at the end. What is this? This is the Gauss. This is k1 times k2. So it's k times k2 minus k1. And what have we learned here is that this is non-positive. So this seems the typical theorem where you do a computation because it seems an interesting computation. You don't know why. You get to the end, and then you put the end hypothesis in the theorem to make it work. Because now, how is it possible that the product of two numbers is non-positive? Well, you assume if, if the first one is positive, the second one must be negative, but how is it possible? This is big minus small. 
So the only possibility is actually they are the same and this is zero. Okay. So this implies the theorem. <clears throat> okay, I leave you a few seconds to finish copying and thinking about this proof because now I have to convince you it was worth spending 40 minutes of your life on this theorem, okay? <clears throat> May I? Because now corollaries. Corollary, which actually was the original reason why Hilbert, this is Gelet Liebman, it was the, orig the, the original proof of this theorem was very complicated and Hilbert came up with a, well, you can see, I think it's fair to say it's a simple proof because it's quite elementary, it's just it's long and you have to make many derivatives, but I mean, you are not really doing anything particularly sophisticated. So that this, you can consider the previous theorem kind of an elementary theorem. It's just it's a long theorem. Okay. So what does this theorem say? Well, a compact, suppose S is compact and connected. And K is positive everywhere. Moreover, assume, suppose H is constant. <clears throat> then, suggestions. What could it be? That's a good suggestion. Well, the sphere certainly satisfies everything, no? In fact, it satisfies even more because this is not just a surface with positive curvature, but it's actually constant positive. So it's even... And, well, of course, I cannot expect another proposal because the theorem says exactly this. Suppose H is constant, then S is a sphere. And in this case, it's not, I don't have to be worried about it's a piece over the sphere so, because it's compact. Okay. So it has to be the whole sphere. <clears throat> Now, how to prove it? Well, of course, sooner or later, Hilbert's theorem will come in. But first, there is a little delicacy. First claim, well, let's get to the claim. So let's see, be a real number such that, now here, I would like you to think that this is a strange statement for a moment. But in some sense, it makes sense. So I'm assuming that the mean curvature is constant. OK? And now I'm, I'm giving a name to the value of this constant. OK. That's OK, but well, first, first, let me argue that C, then the first little claim is that C is non-zero. I don't know if it's positive or negative. Nobody's telling me anything about the sign. But certainly is non-zero. Why? Well, because if it was zero, 
you contradict the Gauss curvature assumption. No? Because otherwise, uh, of course, this can happen only if you have umbilical point. No? K1 is equal to K2. Okay? So K1 is equal to minus K2. Sorry, not umbilical, but okay. Otherwise, K1 is equal to minus K2 because the sum has to be zero. Okay? But then the product cannot be positive. Okay? Okay. And we have exactly the opposite assumption. But now, the, 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 the slight delicate claim is that if you have a surface whose mean curvature in fact, it's never zero, but I mean, suppose it's a constant, non-zero, then S is orientable. Meaning, I can choose a unit normal vector field defined over the whole surface. That's, that means orientable. Remember, locally I can always do it, but globally there are problems, okay? Orientable means no, there are no problems even globally. Well, now, this is a bit delicate. There is not much to write. In fact, probably whatever I write makes more confusion than you have to think of what it means. Now, of course, around any point, I can define N. I have a general theorem that tells me if I have a chart, on this chart I have N. So the problem is not local, it's automatically global. Okay. So suppose at a given point, I choose N in such a way that H with this choice of N is equal to C. So now this is where you have to think that I'm not cheating. Because I said H is equal to C, but H depends on the choice of N. Because otherwise, it becomes minus C. So if you give me one choice, it's C. If you give me the opposite choice, the only other possibility is minus N. I get minus C. So when I decide that H is equal to C, in I can do it. But then, in some sense, this forces the normal vector to be one of the two possibilities at every point. There is only one of the two for which H is equal to C. Do you agree? Fortunately, because C is non-zero, this is where you use, because of course zero is the only number which is equal to minus itself. If, if C was zero, my argument would collapse. Okay? But C, uh, once we observe that C is non-zero, this determines a choice of N. But this N has to be globally defined. Because if it stops to be globally defined at some point, it means at some point it has become minus n. But then h would have become minus c. It looks like a trick. I know. You have to think that the logic is correct. OK? So there is really nothing to write except remembering that the choice of the value of the mean curvature determines a unique normal vector for which that is the value. OK? Once you do that, that's OK. Well, of course, yeah, no, it's OK. Why this is important? Because I want to speak, so OK, so this is done by this uh, implicit argument. If I have an orientable thing, I have a choice of n everywhere, the Gauss curvature, the principal curvature, the mean curvature everywhere become globally defined. So this is the advantage of the important thing. So I can think of k1 and k2 become really function over the whole S. This is the way I want I use it. Otherwise, around every point, I have to take a chart, a normal vector, and compute them. But if I change chart, 
they change. On a non-orientable surface, I cannot speak of K1 globally. Do you agree? So this is kind of the, the, the point, okay? Because we also know that these functions maybe are not really differentiable everywhere, but certainly are well defined now, thanks to this, and are continuous. Are well defined and continuous. And that's enough to use topology. Okay? Because remember now, try to put Hilbert's theorem into the game. I'm looking for a point where K1 as a minimum and K2 as a maximum and K is positive. Actually, K positive, I've put it everywhere. So now I take P such that K1 has a local minimum at P. This exists because now, now I'm using this. So you see now one by one, I've already used this. This actually I used it implicitly in this argument of orientability. Now compactness tells me that this function has a minimum, okay? Now, this point, is this good enough to use Hilbert's theorem? Well, this satisfies one property by brute force. The other property by hypothesis, there is one missing. Is K2, has K2 a maximum at this point? Yes, and now I use again this, okay? Now P is automatically a local maximum for K2 because H is constant. So the sum of K1 and K2 is constant. One has a minimum, the other must have a maximum to balance the other one because H is equal to C. <clears throat> but then what does Hilbert's theorem tell me? Well, not much actually, it seems, because it seems that th this point is umbilical. But actually, if I want to prove that something is a sphere, the only thing I have, the only gun I have is to prove that every point, and this seems to be a very special point, I mean, come on, this is certainly not the generic point, it seems. But no, actually, take another, take Q in S, any point. Now, how much is K2 of Q? Well, P, well, in fact, it's a global max. I mean, also this one, okay? To use Hilbert's theorem, it's enough local, but here I'm using already automatically global maxima, okay? Global minima, global maxima, because I'm using compactness, okay? So wherever Q is, K2 of Q is less than or equal to K2 of P, but this is equal. Now P is umbilical, so this is equal to K1 of P, but P is a minimum for K1, so this is less than or equal to K1 of Q, but this is impossible unless they are all equalities. And Q was any point, okay? So our surface is covered by umbilical points. Every point is umbilical. That's it. Okay. Now, 
Now, in the last 10 minutes, now you can see this proof is actually very flexible. And the most famous, actually, this was the origin of Hilbert's theorem. So, um, but actually, Hilbert himself proved another corollary of his argument, which in some sense it's even more interesting. And this has passed to history as Hilbert Liebman theorem, which says that if a surface, if S is compact and connected, if the Gauss curvature is a positive constant, remember before. We did not require it to be a constant, and it turned out to be a constant. We require it to be positive, but not in principle a constant. Now we require it to be a positive constant. Then, again, S is a sphere. So spheres are actually the, because now, of course, what does a geometer in this sense, in, when studies this subject, that you have defined many functions, k1, k2, h, k. You would like to know, you would like to classify surfaces by looking at these curvatures. So what does it, of course, these are functions, so the, only, the simplest question you can ask is, which are the surfaces for which one or two or three, one of these functions is constant, okay? It's the first question in a general classification theorem. Okay. So if this constant that you have chosen is a positive number, Hilbert tells you it's a sphere. Okay. Nothing else. Then, of course, we will spend a couple of lectures to decide why this is the most important curvature. Okay. But that's another story. Now, the argument is very similar to the one below, to the one uh, of the previous corollary. Okay. First, oh, sorry, actually, okay, this is true. What I said is true, but actually you don't need this. This is important. Maybe on the constant? No. In particular, you cannot produce flat, compact surfaces. Okay. We will, I'll come back to this theorem commenting, but once we understood the, the, the meaning of, of K, okay, in another way. So, in fact, the first thing to observe is that K must be positive. So this const, the first observation is that if you have a compact surface with constant curvature, Gauss curvature, it has to be positive. Well, we observed at the beginning of the lecture that every compact surface has a point whose Gauss curvature is greater than or equal to zero. So this, by that observation, corollary one before, by that observation, this constant cannot be negative. Now you have to improve it a little bit, that argument, to show that this, actually, this constant is actually positive. Okay? Exercise, because it's a minor improvement of what I said in the, in the proof of the corollary. Okay? So you cannot get zero. So this comes from the beginning of the lecture. And now, Now, you see, I would like to play the same game. So I would like to look at the functions k1 and k2 globally on S and then to start arguing as before. So first, I need to argue that the surface is orientable. Otherwise, 
these functions are not global functions. And then if these are not global functions, I cannot use compactness to tell you pick a minimum and pick a maximum, OK? Which is, a, which is, on the contrary, the only way, in general, I can control critical points, OK? So why this should be orientable this time? Well, I want to play the same game as before. If I can prove that the mean curvature is non-zero everywhere, it, you remember, in the previous argument, it was not important, it was a constant. The important thing is that it's non-zero. Okay, because you decide which, so positive or negative, and then the problem is crossing from positive to negative. Because n and minus n differs by minus 1. Okay, so you don't really care that c is a constant in the argument before. Okay, so why this, and I claim that this comes from this. So h is non-zero everywhere. Well, but it's the same argument as before. If it's 0, k1 is equal to minus k2. And then the Gauss curvature is minus k1 squared. Okay, So it's less than or equal to 0. But this is strictly positive. That's it. Game over. Okay. Then the same argument as before. S is orientable. Then I pick 1n, one of the two possible n. And then I have global functions, k1, k2, defined on S. OK? And then again, I pick a minimum, p minimum, for k1, for example. So it satisfies one of the hypotheses. The other one is for free because k at p is positive, because it's positive everywhere. In, part, in this case, it's even constant, but we don't care at the moment. And now I have to argue that this, the same p is a maximum for k2. But again, it's algebra, OK? Which said by a geometer means uh, it's something that, I mean, we are not even supposed to think about, OK? <laughs> we know that k1 times k2 is a constant function. So again, if I pick a minimum for this, automatically I must have picked a minimum for that, OK? Because also, so this automatically means that p is a maximum for k2. But then, we are again in the same situation as before. P satisfies all the hypotheses of Hilbert. So it's umbilical. But again, only P is umbilical. And then you play the same game. Okay? The same, the, what, what, the same thing I wrote before tells you that every point is umbilical. OK, so in fact, this was, in fact, you will find it in books probably as Hilbert's theorem on this one. I mean, but so classification of surfaces of compact surfaces of constant Gauss curvature. In, I hope in four lectures, I will tell you why this is, a, this is not just a nice theorem. I mean, this is really a great theorem. Okay. for reasons you will understand in a couple of weeks. So I'll come back to this. Okay. <clears throat>